gentlemen. Welcome to the Institute of World Politics. Uh, my name is John Lynchowski. I'm president of the Institute. And uh, I uh, would, um, and I'm just delighted to introduce to you an old friend of IWP who has taught here in the past. And I wish he could still be hanging around here and teaching again. In any event, uh, uh, for those of you who are new to the Institute, and I'm sorry some of you, most of you here know us well, but I always feel as though I should explain to those of you who are new that we are not a think tank, that we are an independent graduate school. And we have uh, five master's degree programs. One of them happens to be in strategic intelligence. It's, it's the first uh, degree in intelligence offered uh, in the academic world outside the U.S. government. Uh, we also have a, uh, a, a doctoral program, a professional doctoral program in national security affairs, the first of its kind in the country. And we also have some 17 uh, graduate certificate programs. And it's even possible to take a single course here and audit such a course uh, without having to uh, pay for an entire uh, semester's worth of tuition. Um, I, uh, uh, I'd now like to introduce uh, Nick F. Timiades. Nick uh, is retired from the Department of Defense. He's currently a professor at Penn State University. He has served for 34 years in the government, including uh, uh, in the Central Intelligence Agency as a special agent of the Department of State uh, and the Bureau of Diplomatic Security, and as a senior officer in the intelligence officer at the Defense Intelligence Agency. He has uh, held positions in analysis, human and technical intelligence collection, and program management. Uh, and he has been in one of, he's one of the, the nation's foremost experts on uh, communist Chinese espionage. Uh, he has been called to, to serve, uh, uh, to, to, to provide testimony before Congress, as well as the Cox Commission, which is one of the first major commission reports on the Chinese security threat. Uh, he has uh, testified before the Joint Economic Committee and also briefed all sorts of members of Congress and their staffs. He is one of only seven people appointed to as, as a, an intelligence community associate to the National Intelligence Council, which is the Council of National Intelligence Officers under the direction of the Director of National Intelligence. Uh, he has a, a master's in strategic intelligence from the Defense Intelligence College, a bachelor's in East Asian studies from George Washington. He has written books on, on uh, Chinese espionage, technology, and space issues. And uh, uh, anyway, this goes on and on. He has appeared on, on the media, on the major media, and we're very happy and honored to have him back in our company again today. Nick, the floor is yours. Thank you. I feel like one of those, you know, quit while you're ahead. Uh, so, hi, my name is Nick F. Um, I'd like to take the next 45 minutes or so to talk about um, Chinese espionage, Chinese espionage operations. Uh, in that time, I'll go over in some level of depth uh, why those espionage operations are conducted, how they're conducted, what the methodology is, uh, what the targets are, and uh, look at some case examples to do such. Uh, before I do jump into this, uh, there are a couple of caveats. Uh, number one, I should say I don't speak on behalf of Penn State. Right? I do this sort of research independently, and I do a lot of consulting on the side to business and government. And so um, I want to make sure that that's clear. Uh, likewise, it's because I do have an on and off relationship with the government, I don't speak on behalf of the government as well. Okay, So um, if we're clear on that, I'm, I'm going to go through this. So this, the information you'll see today is based on 285 cases or so that I've cataloged of Chinese espionage. Um, in fact, I have well over 400 at this point, so this is a little dated. Um, but data is just data. So I'm, I'm going to give a cautionary note as we take a look through this to not read too much into it. 
right? Because it's just data. And there are things that, there are unanswered questions in data. There always are. I mean, I, I run across things that, well, how many conviction rates do you have, vice, how many people are, you know, alleged? Well, you have X number of people who ran off before, you know, before they were brought into court and, and faced trial. So how do you factor those data points in? Uh, dates, things like that are always at issue. You know, uh, you detected something in 2018. Great. How long did it go on? Indictment documents and, and, and interview don't always tell you that. Right? So data is what it is. Don't make too much out of it. But that being the case, with the volume of cases that we're talking about, 285 or so, we can make some conclusions on it. Um, given sort of a short time, we're not going to do uh, go way into too much depth. I mean, it's four hours of material I'm going to put into 45 minutes for you. Um, and then we'll have some questions and uh, questions afterwards. Okay, so if that's... Okay, I'll describe to you how we're going to go through this. I'm a walker, so um, I'm going to grab this. This comes from being a professor. So uh, we'll look a little at the uh, cultural characteristics and intelligence. Cultural characteristics are important, uh, particularly when we're dealing with Chinese intelligence, but they are not the end all. Um, and I'll explain that to you as we just start that discussion. Uh, it's a huge analytical pitfall to jump in to understand or think you understand why things happen just because cultural behavior um, attributes. Uh, and I'll discuss that a little more when we talk about it. Uh, we'll look at the espionage operations, the organization and structure of the institutions uh, that are involved with espionage, China's espionage, the categories of espionage. And that's critically important. Um, what are we calling espionage? You know, you, you hear that term thrown around in the media a lot. You hear that word thrown around in the media a lot. If you ask the FBI what their definition of espionage, they're going to give you a definition of espionage, a very legal definition, I'm sure, based on 18 U.S.C. 790 series, right? Uh, you know, the espionage statutes. But that is not the end all of espionage. So we'll, we'll discuss that. And the types of things that um, we look at China and you need to make an intelligence operation run, many of which are illegal, only a small, narrow part of which fit into that definition of espionage. So we'll address that a little in, in, in some level. Uh, we'll look at the information objectives, because when you take a look at hundreds of cases of Chinese espionage, um, and you see what they're after in each case, you can start to bin things. And you can bin them against larger categories of critical technologies and, and industries. And I have done that, so we'll take a look at that. Uh, operations, methodologies, what we call tradecraft, espionage tradecraft. We'll take a look at some of those. And, uh, and then finally, uh, the impact on U.S. security. The so what of it all. I mean, if, if there's no impact, why do we care? You know, what could, what could we possibly care? So we'll take a look through all that, uh, and hopefully we'll have some questions afterwards, and we can go on from there. Okay, um, as far as cultural characteristics go, I think you'll find that um, in China, in dealing with China, and I did part of my undergraduate and, and graduate work in Taiwan and uh, traveled and lived pretty extensively in Hong Kong and mainland China as well. Um, and you will find that history shapes the perception of the West. Okay? And, and this is the Chinese Communist Party never ceases to keep pounding this on that what was called by Mao a century of humiliation. Right, and the Western powers first went in the 1840s and go through a century of humiliation. Much of it's justified and understandable. Some of it's also a little played out for political purposes on the part of our Chinese Communist Party, but it does shape a cultural perspective. Right? For thousands of years, Chinese had that construct of Zhongguo, Middle Kingdom, right? thinking they were the center of, of, um, of the uh, earth, so to speak. And the further away you were, the more of a uh, you know, the more of a foreign devil that, that you were, which I was called on repeated occasions um, throughout my time in, in China. Uh, so they, there's a little cultural approach there and belief structure that, um, that is even present today. And part of that says there's a foreign oppression that the Chinese, or at least on mainland China, are always reacting to what they believe to be the U.S. trying to put them down. And we see that now in, in, in politics as it plays out. You're trying to stop our rise. You're trying to put us down. Uh, so that's one element of culture. And, and it starts to play into the psychology behind you know, why things play out as they do in relative to espionage and theft of technologies. Uh, the other is that you will find in the mainland uh, there's very little trust in government or institutions. 
So this has actually been studied by scholars and written on. Uh, that little trust in institutions, you can see in what they call people's justice, right? You know, it, it's not so much the institutions that provide any baseline of justice, but it is people. In fact, go in and look up, you know, on YouTube, like uh, street incidents or something like that in China, and you'll find someone doing something wrong, and people swarm them and beat the living daylights out of them. Uh, and, you know, it, it's not, oh, let's stop and hold this person and get the cops, or let's, you know, that. It's taking justice into their own hand. And there's a very long history in that. Uh, in the old saying, you know, the, the emperor's far away and the mountains are high. Right? So there's a lot of, you know, we deal locally with these types of issues, and it's a people's justice type of system. So, but that has effects when people don't have trust within their institutions, and it has effects in how they deal and how they have, you know, relationships to society as a whole. In the United States, and, and you can see in the past 10 years, uh, five, 10 years, uh, sort of that issue of trust in institutions comes up again and again and again, and how personal and um, how frightening it is to Americans, right? Americans are, are wrestling with this, this whole construct of our, of our faith within our own democratic institutions. I mean, we see it in the press frequently. Well, in here, you have a society that basically doesn't have a lot of faith in those institutions. So there is that idea of people's, um, people's justice that comes in. And last and certainly not least, we have um, what we call China's glass heart. And um, so frequently, any criticisms, the reaction on, on the part of, uh, you know, culturally in China, is usually strong resistance to anything, oh, you've offended the people. I get that from this lecture. You know, you've offended all the people of China. So, and I say, okay, well, you go out and get 1.4 billion signatures, and, you know, saying that, and I'll, I'll agree with you. But um, uh, it's that any time you say anything negative, you get a very, very strong reaction. So there's a built-in defensiveness, I guess, uh, is the end of this slide. Built-in defensiveness that we see um, within that culture. And particularly against the West, because it's constantly reiterated that there's been a century of humiliation that they've had to contend with. Now, here's the danger. The danger is saying that this exists and is pervasive throughout Chinese culture. It's not. I mean, it, it couldn't be. And uh, actually, one of the best indicators I found in this regard was um, a published manual on interrogation. And that manual went off and gave some level of detail at some of the methods of interrogation, some of the, uh, you know, interviewing people. And it said, well, one approach was to look at the, um, at the uh, belief structure of what was making, why that individual would provide or would not provide information, look at the ideological and belief structure of the person and motivations, the personal motivations. And the other dynamic enclosed was one of, um, of cultural considerations. And interrogators go through this all the time. You know, don't show you the bottom of your shoe and things like that. And all sensitivities to cultural considerations. Why this comes into being is that because even though I would tell you that these are pervasive in Chinese culture, they're also wrong. You can't assume this on every person that you're dealing with. In the same way for interrogations, in the same way for everything. I mean, it's like saying, you know, three-card Monty in New York, you know, the guys on the street corner doing that are representative of all New Yorkers. Well, maybe they are, but they're not representative of all people in the United States. So um, I am a New Yorker, I can say that. Uh, but the, the point is, is that, you know, and even the next slides, which I'll show you, which delve a little more into that cultural aspect of it, um, you can't say that's uniform across the board, okay? It is not. And that's a key component that we have to keep in mind here, okay? And so in, with that in mind, with that in mind, the Chinese saying, nung pian, ju pian, which is, if you can cheat and get away with it, then cheat. Okay, it's just um, a common phrase that you hear. Um, it's, um, you know, not pervasive by any means, but it is a, but, but, but you do hear that pretty often. And you do see a lot of deception in society. A lot of deception in society. One of the, uh, the, the more humorous aspects of this is what we call the white monkey jobs. So if you are a student, and I did this, and I know that, you know, it exists current to this day, tons of people who do. Um, if you're Caucasian, uh, you can get some unique jobs. 
And typically those jobs are representing schools or representing buildings, and, and we'll see some examples of it representing medical institutions and such. Um, because there's a trust, oh, that guy's an American, you know, we trust that he's done uh, you know, his homework and, 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 and we'd rather have that person do it than we would have someone else. So these, these um, actors are used to present a, uh, a company perspective or a company action that is not in fact true. And I'll, I'll explain that, I think, a little more clearly in just, in just a moment. You have issues of fake drugs and housing, things that aren't built up to par. Um, this is just a common dissection in China. You know, they were selling AIDS uh, cures in China some time ago, right? It's all fake drugs. And the government has done, to its credit, a lot to try and clamp down on these types of things, which are absolutely pervasive. The Western concept of corruption in, in society is sort of not the same that you typically find. I mean, people who are caught cheating in China are often referred to as unlucky. Yeah, they were unlucky. Well, it's pretty interesting. We, you know, in the United States, you say, well, let them go to jail and, you know, and, uh, and face the court system. In China, they say, well, that person was unlucky. So it just shows you the difference in perspective. And not necessarily because there's any more in the area of corruption, I mean, than, you know, than the phone scams we have or anything else. It's just the expectation for enforcement and for rules across the board is different. Right? In the United States, not only are there laws, but there is rule of law. In China, you will find lots of laws, not so much rule of law. <laughs> so, now, if you think about this, this starts to play into why people feel differently about stealing technology, about espionage, about you know, their behavior you know, within the United States. People have grown up with this, so the perspective is a little different. You know, when you come to a very, very legalistic culture like the United States, you know, in business, and I, I, I lecture to, to businesses all the time on Chinese negotiating tactics. And if you're in the United States and you have a, a legal issue, you redress it through the courts. If you're in Europe, you're sort of bound by tradition. A little different, but you're very much bound by tradition. If you're in China, neither of those really apply. You know, you're on the outside. So, we have unlucky, unlucky people getting caught. Corruption in Chinese society. We have our own corruption, so I'm not going to tell you it's more. I'm just going to tell you the way of, of redressing it is a little different. By the way, I happen to mention this to an FBI colleague talking about it. And he said to me, do you know what, if, after you take away terrorism and organized crime and the major sort of national security issues, what the FBI's number one investigative priority is? No, what? He said, it's public corruption. Corruption of public officials, which I had no idea, but it sort of tells you how pervasive it is in American society that it's actually addressed by the FBI. So just keep in mind, we may have the same levels of corruption, we just have different ways of addressing it. Um, I like being accurate with these things. In sort of academia, it's really important. Uh, so we have a lack of um, the, rule, the, role, the rule of law. Let's make that a U. Uh, the rule of law, lots of laws, little enforcement. And of course, much in Chinese society is based on guangxi, uh, personal relations, okay? Which is when I talked about intelligence services and private companies and state-owned enterprises, and um, we tend to be very bound, and we, I meant in my former government life, were very, very bound by um, line and block charts. Can't tell you how many times I heard, well, Nick, you know, we can't look at that because it's not, you know, a... Um, it's not a Chinese government-owned you know, organization. I say, yeah, but the colonel is married to so-and-so's daughter who's running that. What, what don't you get here? Because much is done through Guangxi through those personal relationships. So, in other words, you've got to throw out the line and block chart when you're looking at intelligence organizations and the structure and the process. Okay, so um, that being the case, let's take a little look at deception in society. So here we have an individual who is speaking at a reception who is signing a contract with a Chinese company. Um, so Chinese company is selling, you know, holding a public event because they are, uh, you know, have signed a contract with an American company. And the only problem is he's not American and he hasn't signed a contract of anything. He's just an actor. 
And you know, these roles, which these two gentlemen are again in front of a, um, a little school, and what's being portrayed here is, hey, these are the Americans that came in and designed our curriculum and will be teaching your courses. No, they're two actors who got the job off Waypo. Um, these gentlemen over here, which are exceedingly good looking, I'll say that, um, are actors that were uh, brought up in front of a stage and said, these are the engineers who designed our buildings. And in this complex that people were coming in to look at buying. And the woman who spoke to the New York Times about this said, the real estate dealer said, a lot of real estate customers also like for foreigners to pretend to, pretend to be their engineers. So what that means is we tell them foreigners were engineers, so they're really, they feel confident about, you know, that they wouldn't take shortcuts or things like that. And um, here are the engineers. But again, these guys know nothing about engineering. They're like, you know, I did this. I mean, a student, you know. <laughs> yeah. Here's another gentleman who uh, is up here selling medication to a, uh, a, um, a auditorium full of the elderly for, you know, to help their ailments and to help, you know, cure them of their ills. And as he said, he's not a doctor, has no affiliation or knowledge whatsoever. Other ones I've seen are opening up medical, uh, medical wings of a hospital where they'll get an actor in and the guy literally has to go through reading on Wikipedia and putting together briefings from Wikipedia on certain medical things and, uh, and gets up there and pretends to be this you know, famous doctor from the United States coming over to help them open the medical wing while the investors all sit in the crowd. So again, the difference is, I think in the US, if you did this type of thing and there wasn't any type of enforcement, um, you would probably be, uh, uh, again, we, we see it a lot more pervasively than it is, but there is a lot of enforcement. In fact, I'll bring you back for those of you who are sort of close to my age. In the 60s, you used to have a lot of TV commercials where a doctor would be on TV, and then it was on commercials, and then it said under, or under you know, not a real doctor, or something like that. Once they passed legislation, that started to come into being. So they're not at the point where they're putting up signs saying, not a real engineer. <laughs> okay, so that type of deception is still pervasive in society. Okay, so with that backdrop, which helps us understand, okay, I mean, if a person's over here as an engineer or something like that, you know, from the perspective of deception, eh, they're probably, uh, you know, don't quite understand the U.S. legal system and how we approach and the severity of how we deal with things. I mean, historically, when I was in law enforcement, I've arrested people who were speaking to me in Chinese and saying, you know, well, where are we going? I said, well, you're going to jail. We're going to, you know, process you. And, uh, and no, 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 I mean, but where are we going now? I said, well, who am I going to talk to? I said, you're going to jail. And as I went on with these, and I'm translating between a bunch of agents who by this time are hysterical because they don't, this guy doesn't get that he's actually going to jail. He thinks he's going to have this discussion with somebody and see how much it will cost to get out of it. Um, so they're just different cultural perspectives. Uh, in addressing, you know, espionage or why people psychologically motivated, why they do the things they do. So let's talk about category of espionage. Um, we have several categories of espionage. Traditional espionage, which is the 18 U.S.C. 790 series. Okay, uh, covert action. Covert action are those actions which are secret, but if discovered, could sort of lead back to a trail um, to a government as differentiated from clandestine activities, okay? So you, you see the results of covert action generally. Um, so why do we throw this category in? Because not everything is that an intelligence agency does is espionage. And I'll give you an example. Um, if you are conducting espionage and it's you, the case officer, and the recruited asset, well, someone's stealing the material and passing it off to the intelligence officer, which is then going back to the foreign power, right? Okay, we all know this process. The problem with that is that who's renting the safe house? Who's introduced you to that person so that you could build up a relationship with that person who has access to classified materials? So there are all these other categories of activities that are done by recruited people who are aware, most of the time, that they're supporting a foreign power, but technically they're not stealing anything, right? They're not stealing the information and passing it. They're just in a web of recruited assets 
support assets, access agents, things like that, that are assisting in that process. Okay, so the way the United States deals with that is through acting on behalf of a foreign power. Okay, other countries have other terminology that they use for it, but basically we're saying, hey, you know what, you're acting on behalf of a foreign government and you're doing so in a covert manner. So to us, that constitutes, and for my wording on this, covert, you know, constitutes covert action in support of intelligence operations. Economic espionage. Economic espionage, the Economic Espionage, espionage Act of um, 1996 was specifically going after trade secrets and intellectual property. And then we have a whole category of ITAR, Department of Commerce, um, Export Administration Regulations, that I put subheading under illegal exports. Okay, so we basically have four major categories of what I'm rolling into being defined, what the media always lays at being espionage. Okay? So, there's a continuum of Chinese espionage operations, and we start at open source literature which is sort of the most overt component of this. Um, moving to scientific and technical exchanges, trade fairs, Chinese students and scholars, bringing foreign experts to China, purchasing uh, companies abroad, cyber, technology theft, and by that I mean the illegal exports, all the way up to espionage. And you see along this continuum, most overt to the most clandestine means. Chinese students and scholars. If, I, if you take the FBI for what they've said recently, which is that they have cases going on in 54 offices. 54 offices they have cases going on. I would contend to you, just to put this in perspective, right? So, so we're all talking about the same thing. Just to put this in perspective. If they had 10 cases apiece, which is a physical impossibility on dealing with um, espionage, uh, economic espionage, if they had 10 cases apiece, because the office wouldn't be doing anything else, that would be 540 cases. Okay? Let me see if my math is right. There are 375,000 Chinese students and scholars. 375,000. Even if there was 10 cases, which is an impossibility, that would be what? 37,000 would be 10%, 3,700 would be 1%, so one-fifth of that. So we'd be basically 20% of 1% of, you know, given the numbers of Chinese scholars and students here. So my, my point in, in bringing that out is a simple dose of reality. Don't run out of here thinking, oh my God, we're under siege, you know, <laughs> there's, there are spies everywhere. Take the simple truth in the matter, just look at the numbers, 375,000, I mean, even if you pick an extreme case like 10 cases apiece in those offices, you're still at a fraction of 1% on the numbers here. Okay, so we've got to put this in context. Is that a problem for law enforcement? Sure, it's a problem for law enforcement because we don't have the resources to contend with it, the intelligence or the law enforcement. In society, is it a big number compared to the population base? No, it's an absolute minuscule number. So you've got to leave with that understanding and putting it in context. Law enforcement intelligence problem, Society, not a problem. Okay? I mean, a very, very low percentage. One percent, less than a percent. Okay, so let's look at some, starting with that left side of the, um, of the uh, uh, chart, let's look at some of the institutions. Again, I'll, I'll tell you that we have our own institutions. If I was, gonna, if I was in China doing this in the United States, I would put the Library of Congress up there, and I would be ranting and raving. They collect millions of documents from all over the world in the most obscure publication, <laughs> and they do. But, you know, we don't necessarily find that to be a nefarious act. So, um, so just to, to level the playing field so you understand. Um, we have the National Science and Technology Library. And uh, several of the uh, institutions, the Science Academy, Agricultural Academy, Medical Science, all of which collect open source literature, have accesses to multiple, you know, tons of U.S. databases on this. Um, the Patent Documentation Library. That's a little iffy, simply because there has been some, um, some leakage, if you will, on researchers out of that and defining their responsibilities about uh, helping companies uh, go around existing patents. 
that, that exist, helping them find a way around existing patents. But, um, so that is not exactly the way that we approach it in just collecting that material and presenting it, you know, and providing it for companies or for individuals who want it. So, but this is a very, very wide scheme. So the knowledge base, you know, the ability to open source collect technology is second to none in the world. I mean, absolutely. And if you're looking in that world in open source intelligence, it's a phenomenal collection capability that they have. Okay, if we look at that overall area of technology collection, we have that, um, that open source collection. We have the intelligence services, which we'll have in some level of uh, discussion. Uh, the business environment, which is orchestrated and controlled to take um, technology from foreign businesses in China. That's what is one of the central points in the negotiations, the trade negotiations ongoing now. We have talent recruitment programs, like the Thousand Talents program, which I'm sure um, you've heard of, people are familiar with. Interestingly enough, when that uh, recent arrest, I guess a few months ago, uh, someone was arrested who was in the ta Thousand Talents program, and China, the Communist Party, directed universities and other institutions to take that down off the websites. No more advertising the Thousand Talents program. Still exists, but removed from the websites. Front companies, foreign acquisitions, science and technology investments, non-traditional collectors, in a couple of cases, and aerospace technology that I was looking at, we had individuals who were, sorry, I want to be careful, I don't walk off camera here. <laughs> they warned me about that. I need to put a chalk on the ground or something. Um, I saw cases where people were selling um, the technology that they had stolen on the dark web. That's a non-traditional collector. Right? That's someone who's looking to market, um, and not only for, in this case, for their universities that they were selling back to, but to anyone else who they could sell it to as well. So, A for entrepreneurship, um, but, uh, you know, got caught. Uh, joint ventures, academic collaborations, and research partnerships. Okay, all components of a technology collection, collection program on a very, very large scale. Talk a bit about doing business in China. That's because it's such a, um, a prevalent issue. So uh, some of the rules for that is that the company has to pass national security reviews, foreign company, okay, has to pass national security reviews for technology and services, has to store all their data in China, has to form a joint venture to open up a data center, has to gain government approval for data transfers, has to buy government-approved encryption technology and VPNs, virtual private networks. Okay, so those are basically the, the terms of you doing business in China. You know, as I say to U.S. businesses, if you think your technology is safe here or any of your communications are safe, you know, I'm here to tell you they're not. Okay, it's just uh, the government has um, access to uh, intellectual property and proprietary data you know, uniformly throughout the business community dealing in China. Okay, and you, you know what? It's okay if you have an exit strategy. You're just going there for X number of years to make money, but eventually, you know, you're, you're going to lose it all in your uh, proprietary data and technology. So, and this, the DNI has commented on this exactly the same way. Technology transfer centers. So, about 2007, um, China had established technology transfer centers and they have them at national, municipal, and overseas branches. Uh, we'll discuss that in just a, a second, actually in the next slide. Uh, as one of the ways of transferring technology from their relationship with the West, from their relationships um, externally, and even with internally, within China, into companies and organizations that are interested, right? So you don't have to know specifically all over the Nanjing Science and Technology University. Um, you can go to a technology transfer center and they will scout, they will understand the technology that's out and about that might fit your specific business need. But this is also where a lot of the stolen technology flows through, right? These, na these are national technology transfer centers, overseas branches of those as well. There are international symposia and workshops, international technology transfer conventions, uh, government to company, B2B online, you know, business-to-business -business online uh, transfers, and uh, high-tech development zones where they pair experts and companies. So the, the point of this is it's not like you find in other countries where it might be a very clandestine secret you know, element amongst a local security service that is funneling or working for a specific customer. 
the technology that's stolen on a massive scale is going on a very large scale to interested parties within China. And if you want to talk about the scale of this, we're looking at, under the Ministry of Science and Technology, 453 national technology transfer centers. That's scale, folks. That's not one center, that's not 10 center, that's 453 centers, and that is just at the national level. There are hundreds more at, um, at regional levels. Okay? So, let's talk a little about PSC, uh, PRC intelligence organizations. Ministry of State Security, um, some roll up between CIA and the FBI. Uh, the People's Liberation Army General Staff Headquarters, Second Department, the State Administration for Science and Technology and Industry for National Defense, and they have specifically an intelligence bureau within that organization, responsible for the oversight of uh, science and technology development in China. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party has a separate investigations department and a United Front Work Department that has what we would call covert action and trying to work with um, overseas groups to, for, to advance China's interests, and mostly we see this politically. The State Council has a Taiwan Affairs Office. Uh, State-owned enterprises, including CCP Organizational Department, um, State Assets and Supervision, and Administration Commission. Now, these are kind of important, the state-owned enterprises, of which there's something in the order, I think, of 103,000 of them, okay? Uh, have a very, very strong connection to the Chinese Communist Party. You cannot sit in leadership in a state-owned enterprise unless you are a member of the CCP, unless you are vetted by the CCP organization department or basically a personnel department, right? And they're the ones who make the position, they're the ones who decide who will take what jobs. Okay, so there's a control function over the state-owned enterprises, and many of those China has put in the category of critical um, technologies, including information technology. Uh, and it's very, very closely controlled and dominated by the, um, by the Chinese Communist Party. We see that to a degree with private companies as well. Uh, private companies as well, and Xi Jinping has made this point um, over the last two years, in fact the CCP as a whole has made it, point that those companies will have um, Chinese Communist Party uh, committees, and they will have those committees as guiding functions for the, com for the companies, private companies, to serve the interests of China. Now, it's important in your head that you distinguish between what we call in the United States a private company and what we're talking about here. Okay? Still to be the same type of private company, although one has a CCP committee embedded within them that guides the company and ensures that it is, um, that it is uh, you know, serving China in addition to its work. And the Chinese Communist Party has put out doctrine on that to make it official. Sorry, last but certainly need, not least, individual uh, entrepreneurs, people who see the opportunity and are willing to steal technology and say, hey, I have this of interest, I want to go back and get a job with you, and we see cases after cases of that. Okay, information objectives. These information objectives, the original information objectives, are taken from the DNI. What I've done here is highlight or darken uh, ones that we have a cluster of Chinese espionage activities directed towards. So we'll see biomanufacturing bio and chemical manufacturing, and of that, uh, genetically modified organisms, infectious disease treatments, new vaccines and drugs, very, very dense um, uh, approach on, the, uh, on marine systems, uh, aerospace technology development, radar optics, space infrastructure, and exploration technology. Uh, we also see a lot in high-end manufacturing and advanced robotics and aircraft. Composite materials, huge um, effort towards composite materials. And, of course, networking equipment. Uh, I, I did a slice out of that 285 cases of the ones that were specifically directed against aerospace technology, and there were 63 related cases, five of which, as tradecraft goes, used no tradecraft at all, were just people, you know, out and about trying to, you know, trying to work and steal technology, sending emails back and forth to China. 21 of those um, operated under false names, or involve the use of third parties. 16 actually use standard encryption techniques to hide their transactions. Eight use, sorry, we're delving really into the, um, to the espionage component of this. Uh, it was a fast dive, I apologize. 
Um, eight used tailor-made devices or techniques or had third country meetings mostly, right? Third country meetings to avoid the security apparatus in the United States. And two were cyber with insider access for a total of 10 persons in that. Okay, also in the aerospace industry, we find 16 of those uh, cases were working directly for the Ministry of State Security, 31 for the People's Liberation Army, 13 for state-owned enterprises, Three were private companies, just working with private companies back in China. The first most targeted ent entities were U.S. private companies. Second most targeted was Taiwan military personnel. And the third most targeted were U.S. Department of Defense. Okay, let's move a little towards the espionage operations and tactics. The categories, discussed this in the beginning. ITAR, International Traffic and Arms Regulations, straight out espionage, economic espionage, 23% of all the cases, um, export administration with 27%, and covert action 3.9%. And this is all of those 285 cases that I mentioned. The PRC customers, where this information was going back to, well, in 72 cases, it was going back to state owned enterprises. So the argument that all oh, these aren't government entities, you know, they're state-owned enterprises really falls flat when you look at the majority of cases going back to state-owned enterprises. 60 were going to private companies. 57 were uh, going back to the Ministry of State Security. 61 PLA and 17 other entities within the uh, PRC. The case distribution, um, if we look at the case distribution of where these cases have occurred, uh, you'll see a lot in, certainly California, the largest amount, uh, Taiwan, New York, New Jersey, and uh, Washington, D.C., Virginia, sort of are the biggest areas. Another way of just seeing that um, case distribution within the United States We'll talk a little about tradecraft, or maybe not. Ah, move up. Okay, so my um, definition for tradecraft here is, um, and we'll see some of this when we look at some more stats on the Ministry of State Security. Half the Ministry of State Security cases are done with no tradecraft at all. Some of them are done, uh, Greg Burgesson, I think his name was, right? Kid who was uh, recruited in Shanghai, was sending text messages back and forth to his handlers. Uh, one recent case this past October, a guy from Chicago, I forgot his name offhand, he, uh, he was sending back emails openly to his MSS handler, but sort of masquerading the conversation as <coughs> graduate records or something like that, you know, classes, courses. And in the case of um, Kevin Mallory, we had the Chinese government, with Ministry of State Security, issued him a phone with encryption software that was designed to hide the communications, which failed, but it was designed to hide the communications. So we see one organization, the Ministry of State Security, three different cases, three completely different approaches in professionalism to espionage tradecraft. So this is what I define as islands of excellence. Is there excellence in the tradecraft? Sure. Is it pervasive? Absolutely not. And if you actually walk that back for an intelligence service, it tells you something about their recruitment and their training functions on how it lacks any type of uniformity within that. And I say this over and over and over again and looking at MSS cases that are completely done in the open. Oh, well, you know, call me up. Really? <laughs> you got a guy stealing something. You're gonna, he's going to call you internationally to tell you what he's stealing? You know, probably not the best security, operation security, as we call it. There's the employment of commercial and official covers. So we see commercial covers um, used through the, uh, through the embassies and the consulates, as well as uh, you know, uh, official covers. And we see commercial covers, business covers. I'm guessing that's a warning. Um, linear and third country control. Linear control from the United States back to Beijing. Third country control through another country. We, I rarely see control within the United States. One case, perhaps or two cases had control of elements within the United States, you know, an espionage net, as they traditionally called. More often than not, that control mechanism goes straight back to, uh, straight back to China or through a third country. 
which is sort of interesting. You know, it begs for a little more examination. Recruitment is often done in China because it's safer to, if you're going to recruit someone to conduct espionage, much safer to do it in China on your own turf. And uh, as I mentioned, that communications is covert and open. We see it both ways. Uh, for domestic trade craft, there's visiting experts that are, that are, um, that are exploited. Happens frequently, in, uh, inviting visiting experts, paying a fare, and then um, pressuring them to give more information. There's a diplomatic services bureau that focuses very much on um, on foreign diplomats and personnel, you know, people, company, people living in China. Uh, technical surveillance conducted by the PLA's third department, Ministry of State Security, Public Security, which also does the internet, um, uh, Great Bamboo Wall, and the Ministry of Post and Telecommunications. Okay, all three have different responsibilities for technical surveillance within China. Work units, Tanwei. Um, exist in academia and have over the past three years had quite a resurgence inside companies. Uh, just some other aspects of, um, of tradecraft and use. False names, documents or third parties to shipment as a method of tradecraft. We see a very large use of that in a number of records. Encryption standard hiding techniques and end meetings in China. We see a second highest use of those techniques for to conduct espionage. No trade craft, open or you know, open communications and true names, third highest, which is insane. Why would you do that? But but it is that way. I mean, indictments clearly show that that's that's what happens. And then tailor-made devices uh, or meetings in third countries to avoid security is the uh, the last used category. So what this shows us as a function of OPSEC operation security, not really great. Which is sort of to be understood, you know, because they're employing a lot of state-owned enterprises, private companies, and universities to execute this. Uh, again, more colors. So what we have here is uh, the specific number of state-owned enterprises using false names. You know, the same chart, but broken down as to, as to who's doing what. State-owned enterprises, private, um, you know, who's receiving it. Uh, private, PRC, PLA, Ministry of State Security, and you can see those... Um, repeated under each trade craft. So what this shows us is that, well, for tailor-made devices, we had the PLA or third country meetings, okay? Third country or tailor-made devices. We have state-owned enterprises doing it, the PLA and the Ministry of State Security. For no trade craft, why the heck do we have the Ministry of State Security? And, and yet it's up there with nine cases. 23 private companies, you'd sort of expect that. Right? Private companies are not likely to em employ intelligence trade craft, espionage trade craft. Same thing with state-owned enterprises, not as likely. But you wouldn't think you'd see that in the Ministry of State Security. Here we're looking at encryption and standard hiding techniques plus meetings in China, come to China. We have the MSS at 20, and you can read the numbers, the PLA at 17, and state-owned enterprises at 24 cases. So, impact on U.S. security. We have impacts on the U.S. economy through intellectual property, trade secrets, and pirated software. We have impacts on the United States national security, and lastly, even on our governments. So, there is between five and five point five trillion dollars worth of intellectual property in the United States. At least that's the uh, those are the numbers that we like to kick around. IP theft, intellectual property theft basically exists in three categories. Pirated U.S. software is estimated to about 18 billion. Pirated tangible goods, 41 billion. Trade secret theft, between 180 and 40 billion. The DNI estimates that at about 400 billion. My estimates after I ran numbers on it compared to what the Europeans said, you know, what the EU said, was um, about 367 billion. So, that is just cash, okay? That doesn't take into account the long-term effects on industries, um, long-term effects on production capabilities, loss of jobs, and the cascading impacts that go along with that. Once you start losing jobs in industries, the ca cascading impacts that go through society and through the social welfare system and everything else that uh, is impacted by that type of theft. The loss of industries, reliance on others, and then certainly the trade imbalance. 
economically. The impact on national security, uh, we have a loss of U.S. military technological advantage, which is probably one of the key things that I believe we worry as a nation state worry about. Uh, advances in PLA military technology, we've seen these in offensive weapon systems, robotics, hypersonics, and naval systems. And I'll stress that, offensive weapon systems, right? Because defensive, you know, there's sort of a who cares from the United States. Uh, when it's attack drones and hypersonics that are used in the South China Sea, that tends to be a little more of a, of a frightening issue for the United States. Increase in PLA space and counter space capabilities, no doubt we've had an extraordinary increase over the last 12 years you know, in their ability. And basically the result of that is changing the balance of power in Asia. And it has an impact in that sense on a foreign policy perspective on the US and its allies. Um, the impact on governance. Well, we certainly had the covert action component of this. And, you know, I, I hesitate to throw in the Confucius Institutes. I know that's been a huge um, discussion point in education circles as well as in government circles, but there is certainly a media funding education campaigns. I mean, I get trolls. I'd be stunned if you don't have them assaulting me online now. Uh, and one of them, in fact, Hugo, one of my favorite. If you're watching Hugo, <laughs> I've got your number, sunshine. Um, <laughs> So, and I'll tell you how fascinating this guy is because I saw him up on this, uh, you know, and giving comments. And he's always oh, very articulate, right guy, very articulate, attacking the U.S. position in, in support of China. And suddenly I took a look and I clicked on him and looked at his background. Hugo, you have 30,000 comments in two years. I started doing the math. You know what? This is like 200 and something comments per day, seven days a week. Don't tell me you're not a troll. Either you don't have a life, or someone's paying you to do this, one of the two. It's pretty easy to find out. And, you know, Hugo ignores them, and I chase them around online and things like that. But, uh, but it, it's interesting when you think about it from an American perspective. Would we go out and hire an army of people to go trying to manipulate public opinion? No, not really. I mean, political parties do that all the time, every four years. But... We don't, as a nation state, do that, you know, abroad and with putting the nation's money behind it. That, in our minds, crosses a line, but that is quite pervasive here. So there is a threat, particularly within fake news, the use of artificial intelligence, that actually poses a threat to democratic institutions. So I do want to leave with that, uh, that note. Liberal democracies, their institutions are vulnerable to this type of work, which is, to be frank, propaganda, which is not a negative word in China in the Chinese Communist Party, and uh, it does leave us vulnerable to that type of manipulation. Okay, so that about wraps up, and I'm sorry, I think I ran over, but we have a couple of minutes for questions. So if it's okay with you, I'll just take questions. Um, so let's start with the gentleman with the camera, for example, and then you, sir, next. Here's a microphone. Yeah, it's right up here. So go ahead, yell it out. I'll, I'll repeat the question. I'm uh, Peter Humphrey. I'm an intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. Um, First, I'm wondering when uh, your pioneering book uh, will be updated to the present. Um, and second, um, I think two can play this game, but we have this structural problem where even if we got the blueprints of a hypersonic missile, do you hand it to Lockheed or do you hand it to Boeing? Well, but, so let, let me um, answer the first question, which is soon. Now, I, I'm going to spend a lot of this summer working on that, uh, updating that book. And as I said now, I have over 400 cases, so I, I expect to produce some good data out of it. Um, in the meantime, I'll be doing a lot of writing on articles and such. Uh, and, but to answer your second question, we don't play that game. It is, a, it is against every well, there's fiber. A problem. No, it really isn't. I mean, a, a system is not meant to work that way, our system. Not, you know, okay, if you want to cheat and do it, but it's, it doesn't work for our system. So, in a democratic system, we, we, we just can't do that. Sir? Uh, yes, sir. I'm Chris Orr. I'm a current uh, contractor with the Defense Security Service. I'm also a former Customs and Border Protection Officer and High Special Agent at the Los Angeles Long Beach Seaport. So, uh, getting going to law enforcement back, and I'm sure you're familiar with the snakeheads, i.e. the Chinese criminal gangs that are yeah. responsible for smuggling the uh, stowaways through seaports like my former workplace. Uh, are you aware of any direct connection between these snakehead gangs and Chinese uh, intelligence services? Um, longer question. Direct is such a, a difficult thing in China. Um, 
if you don't mind, I'll defer that to laughter because it's a little bit of a lengthy question. Man, you had a question? Yes. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, Professor. Uh, my name is Amanda Wan. I'm a doctoral student here at IWD. Um, so I was wondering if there are cases where China has run illegals. Um, in the Western sense, it's a lock, non-official cover, like how Russians do. And two, um, if there were any cases where China has used North Koreans as surrogates in operating espionage against the uh, United States. I don't know of any. And I would tell you I'd sort of doubt it because I don't think there's, but there's, you know, North Korean guys are still the ones who come up on the shoe, on the board, shores of the beaches with the wrong kind of shoes and everything else. So I, they are. I mean, and, and as far as espionage goes, China's a, li a light year ahead of them. So it would be tough for me to, I'm not saying it's impossible, but tough for me to find, um, you know, North Korean cases. Cases of Knox are, are very, you know, it's interesting case in Poland recently where they, where the Polish government arrested the head of Huawei. Um, in Poland, the guy had worked years earlier in the uh, Chinese consulate, was a Chinese uh, embassy official. So I don't know if anyone's dug into his uh, into his background and seen just how much he really left. But it'd be interesting if he just sort of went to a non-official cover status, you know, for for X number of years. So, uh, but the answer to your question on Knox is we see a lot of it. So, ma'am, are you aware of? Um Chinese messages left on people's cell phones. It's been all throughout the Washington Yeah, area. it's a scam. I've, it's, what are they saying and what's it about? You know? um, it's, uh, gosh, you know, so I had this uh, about a year ago and I completely forgot what the message was. It was calling for something uh, that I remember. I, just, I couldn't hear the message over my own laughing, to be honest. But it's actually had nothing to do with the embassy, even though it said it did on the phone. And I'm like, what the heck? How'd they track me down? But, uh, but it just so happens it's a, it's a scam thing. And back, sir. Paul Kerbin, retired Foreign Service. Speaking of Huawei, uh, mm -hmm. I've not heard very much about what the New Zealanders found on the Huawei servers, the extra technology. And speaking of the Chinese being after something, what were they after in the OPM 21 million file rate? Well, um, when you get the files of people who have security clearances, uh, let's see how we gingerly say this. So those are done by different agencies. It's not all uniform across the board. So when you do get that, you can often tell who does what, you know, who's with what. So it's it's a really um, it's easy to slice and dice and see, you know, who works for Department of Defense and who doesn't across the board. So it, it's a it was a real coup for their intelligence activities. They took a back door in and really um, and clobbered us intelligence wise. It'll take decades to get past that one. Um, we can actually, you know what? I, I don't have time to read it now, but I prepared a whole list of notes on what we know about Huawei. So, if anyone's actually interested, we can go over that afterwards. Sorry, a couple more questions, and we'll call out that, ma'am. Hi, my name is Helen. I'm a recurring principal at the United States Service in Sichuan, China. So, in our orientation, we talk a lot about um, why we're actually serving in China, and um, I'm really curious to actually hear about what you have to say about the Confucius Institute um, or your anecdote about Hugo. Um, because a lot of our training staff said that if it wasn't for the Confucian Institute in the United States, Peace Corps China doesn't really need to exist. And having served, I agree. But I do think that the power of attraction is very real. So I'm curious to so I, you know, you'll you'll find no bigger fan of the of Confucius Institutes than me. I, I you know, great, fine, don't have a problem with it. What I do have a problem with is contracts in secret. Um, if you if you make the contracts public, and you know what, they're supposed to be public. According to law, they're supposed to be public. You know, any educational institution in the United States receiving money, you know, which has received money from the federal government, including grants and loans and things like that, must report those contracts with foreign governments to the Department of Education. You know how many does it? Probably zero. But it is in law. They're supposed to do that. That's the that's the deal they accept when they take monies from the United States and. So I'm, you know, fine. I'm thrilled. I've been at Tai Chi training with the Confucius Institutes. I don't have a problem with it, um, but the contracts have to be legal because everyone's. It's, you know, this is the United States. We've got to know when you're dealing with the foreign government what's what the relationship is. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, uh, sir. So the Cox report came out in the late '90s or early 2000s, I believe. I can't remember. '98. Okay, um, and with 300 billion plus leaving the country every year, what what are the biggest stumbling blocks to fixing this? Why is it taking so long? Where is the awareness? 
what can we do better? Like, what are the biggest fixes, I guess? All right. Well, <laughs> it's a big question. Actually. It's a huge yeah. question. Um, you know, and it's on multiple fronts. I will say at this point, we, um, we are taking a good look. There's 20 years of failed U.S. policy on this. I am, you know, no, not mincing words. On, we have 20 years of failed policy in dealing with China on trade, dealing with China on technology, and a host of other things. And I, I, I think it's on this administration, you know, regardless of whether you love the administration or hate it, you know, it's on their shoulders to fix the problem. So they are trying to fix it. It's going to be hard going, and, uh, and we'll see how it turns out. But, you know, 200 different lists of things you could do. Last question. Do we have time for another question? We'll make it two more then. Sir. Uh, my name is Jared Richardson. I'm a student at GW, a former uh, veteran. Uh, and uh, I have a question about the, uh, the rules in China for uh, foreign businesses. Uh, have, have those relaxed at least slightly? And has, is Boeing, has Boeing, do they have a facility in China? Or are they building a facility in China? Or, yeah. Um, so, Number one, it's not former veteran, you're a veteran. Right? Right, so, right. I, I was correct, it's a former Sorry, I, uh, I, I drive my kids nuts with stuff like that. <laughs> uh, so, uh, number one. Number two, there has been discussion, I think as recently as a month ago, of relaxing the rules on that. I don't know exactly how much has, has actually come through on relaxing the rules. You know, China's not the first one to do that either. Um, Russia has similar rules. Korea has very, very um, um, you know, stringent rules in that regard. So. But I think part of this is going to, certainly this is going to be one of the focal points, is one of the focal points of the trade negotiations. Um, Boeing has, not only has a facility, I believe, in China, but they also have multiple other ones that they have purchased in China. And I can remember years ago having discussions with them on their purchasing of facilities and what type of information they asked for in the books and all those types of things. So the answer to your question is yes, I'm a Boeing. Is that worse than you at all? Oh, I don't have much stock in Boeing, so no. <laughs> Now, last question. Can I? Uh, I'm trying to be respectful of, of the time here, even though no one's thrown anything at me yet. Do we have any more questions? Okay. In that case, thank you very much. Mic drop. Everything. Have a good night.